Hello, lovely ladies and gentlemen. This is the Vice President of Internet Infidels, Edward Tamesian. I'm here with our President, John McDonald, and I'm here again for the fifth time to interview the great and legendary Dr. Richard Carrier. And you should check out his official website, richardcarrier.info. And we're going to begin the questions. Yeah. So, <laughs> there you go. Richard Carrier, everyone. All right. Hello, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, me and him actually had a lunch in San Antonio at a restaurant called Supper at Hotel Emma. It was nice. We talked a lot yeah. about the guard story and other interesting things. <laughs> All righty, going into our first question. If Jesus did not exist as a historical person, how do you interpret what Paul writes in Galatians chapter 3, verse 1? Since it seemingly implies that Christ's crucifixion was witnessed on earth. And Paul says, you foolish Galatians, who has cast a spell on you before whose eyes Jesus Christ was publicly portrayed as crucified? And that's from the Christian Standard Bible. Yeah, it's a good question because it's a confusing verse. Um, not least because the Galatians are in the middle of Turkey. So how on earth <laughs> could they have witnessed the crucifixion? Uh, the Galatians are actually also Celts. Um, so the Celts actually invaded, this is hundreds of years before, invaded into Turkey and then actually settled Gal what became Galata. Galata just means Celt Celtland. So it's actually a, a population of Celts in the middle of uh, um, Turkey. So, yeah, I mean, this is these, and these are people that Paul evangelized later. So obviously they weren't there for the crucifixion. So how could the Galatians, the whole of the Galatians, have seen it. Um, <clears throat> I'm not entirely sure why it's been mistranslated, but that's actually a mistranslation. When you look at the Greek... The word is proagraphe, which means for written, means written down before. Uh, so he's talking about, I showed you the scriptures. He's, I, you know, I opened the book, I showed you the scriptures before your eyes, I showed you the scriptures predicting that Jesus would be crucified. So it doesn't actually have anything to do with uh, seeing the crucifixion itself. Okay. So he's just saying, hey, here's some Old Testament verses that point to Christ. That's what he means, that's what you're saying? I mean, he, yes, uh, he, he did that before. He's recalling that you know he's bringing their memory back saying remember when i showed you the scriptures that yeah so he said like before your eyes it was forewritten i showed you right like that's what he's talking about um so yeah it doesn't it doesn't actually mean uh the publicly portrayed thing is like it's not an accurate people yeah 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 all righty going into our second question think you'll appreciate this one there are four endings to mark's gospel we have textual evidence of Long ending, the short ending, the kind of longer ending, and the one found in the freer Ligoin, Ligoin, <laughs> concerning the fear of the power. The, of the freer Logion. Freer Logion. The freer Logion. Oh, that's what, there that's we what go. it is. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's pretty clear that Mark originally ended at 16, verse 1 through 8, since you have to consider it would be pretty idiotic for some early scribe to simply see verses 9 through 16, or however long it goes off to, and just say, yep, I'm going to admit all of this, and then give the manuscript to the guy who hired him without putting in the rest, you know, from the original. So, <laughs> um, plus verses 9 and onwards don't seem to be written by the same person who wrote the rest. So my question is, under the assumption that whoever wrote Mark ended at verse 8, Chapter 16, verse 8, what would their motive be? Why not include appearances of Jesus to the women or other disciples, since the author would have heard about those stories by 55 AD to 70 AD, the typical dates given to Mark? And would this not be evidence that Mark came before Matthew? Since if Mark had a dependency on Matthew, like Matthew comes later and uses Mark, mm. why the heck would Mark omit you know, the resurrection appearances to the men and all that? Yeah, um, <clears throat> yeah, there's... That's true uh, that the um, it would be weird for Mark to cut that. Uh, remember, Mark is Mark is we got to understand Mark is writing probably the first one to write this story. Right. So he's not thinking in the ways that the later writers are. The later writers are inspired by Mark. So they're spinning off of Mark. They're coming up with other things. When Mark's writing, he's got his own agenda. So you have to understand Mark on himself and on the understanding that no one else has done this before. And he's doing it by himself. Um <clears throat> But first, let's 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 unwind some of those things. There's actually five uh, endings to Mark, uh, not not just four. So there, there's the ending at verse eight. There's the short ending. There's the long ending. Uh, there's the freer logion, and then there's the a Bobienzis epiphany. So there's a version of Mark that has a flight of angels visit the tomb, and Jesus flies off into space with the angels and stuff. Um, yeah. So there, there's actually five different. <laughs> what was endings it called to Mark. again? It's the it's the manuscript is Codex Bobiensis, uh, and it's the Bobiensis epiph. What's that? Oh, sorry. When does it date to approximately? Uh, 
I um, can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, it's got to be like fifth or sixth century. Um, well, the ends are interesting. Yeah. Um, it could be earlier. I mean, the, the manuscript has a date, but, but when the text originates, that's a whole other question because yeah, that, sure. that manuscript might preserve an earlier text. Um, I talk about all of these endings and the manuscripts and the, I cite the sortations extensively in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. Uh, that's my book that, that has a collection of uh, my work, all my peer reviewed stuff up to 2014 that was published in journals and magazines and things like that. And a few other things as well uh, are in that book. And one of them is my extensive discussion of the long ending or the ending of Mark. Uh, and it has, it's, it's probably the ultimate go to reference for that because I have, have all the scholars cited. I have all the, the evidence discussed and all of that, um, including the Bobienzos ending. Uh, yeah. It, it, so anyway, the point being is that no one liked the ending of Mark. So everybody kept trying to change it. Uh, and so uh, that's one thing we notice. That gets us then to the question, why, right? Why would Mark end it there? Um, now there's two there's two answers to this that make sense and none of the others actually do. Um, certainly we can rule out the long, we can rule all the other endings we have, we can rule out on stylistic grounds and a lot of other evidence that are absolutely not written by Mark. Um, it is possible that there is a lost ending to Mark. Uh, and that's one of the two explanations that, that at least makes sense. Uh, and James Tabor is one who's known for arguing for the missing text. He's not the only one. There have been a few scholars who've argued that there's a curiosity that Mark lacks both the nativity and the appearance narratives. Mm -hmm. And you can explain this if you're missing that top sheet of the choir. So so it's a codex, right? So like if you if you lose the top sheet, you lose the last page and the first page, both sides, right? So you have basically four pages it could get torn away. And so this this theory, which like multiple scholars have suggested, is possible. It's not generally accepted as what happened, but it is possible that this happened that we lost any that Mark actually had a nativity and actually had appearance narratives, and we lost them. Um, and uh, James Tabor has made a good argument that if that's the case, if if you accept that explanation, that's you're already inventing an epicycle to like get there, right? Like because we don't have any evidence that that's happened, but if it happened. Um, that would explain why it starts abruptly with just John the Baptist, and it would explain why it ends abruptly. Uh, and uh, Tabor has argued that the added ending, so the, the Gospel of John has been multiply redacted. Uh, it, we do not have the original version. It, it was re-edited by someone else and then re-edited a, a second time. And we only have the second, uh, basically the third edition of it. We don't have that, the earlier versions. Now, someone tacked on the second ending, that's John 21. Uh, and Tabor makes the point that the book appears, Gospel of John appears to end in, in chapter 20. And then suddenly the, the disciples are in Galilee. It's not explained why. And they uh, encounter Jesus, but don't even know that Jesus is alive to be encountered. So it's like the, the writer of chapter 21 didn't even know that there was an appearance of Jesus with the wounds and the doubting Thomas and all that stuff like that hadn't even happened. So that la that ending appears to come from another gospel. It got tacked in from some other gospel. And the argument is, is Tabor's argument, uh, is that that's the lost ending to Mark. Now it's been redacted. So our version of it is not exactly what would be in Mark. It's been edited by the authors of John, the last editors of John. So it's been modified. So it's not exactly it. But that would explain a lot of things. It would explain why the women didn't tell them uh, and couldn't have done, by the way. They couldn't have gotten to Galilee in time to tell them by Sunday, right? Um, the women didn't tell them anything, and so they don't know Jesus is risen. They're they're despondent, so they've gone back to their fishing, right? They're back to their trade. They've given up, uh, and then there's the appearance of Jesus, etc. Uh, and that would fit at the ending of Mark in terms of the way Mark is written. So that would work as an ending of Mark, and so that's Tabor's argument. Um, I think it's plausible. I, I'm not convinced, and here the one reason I'm not convinced is that it requires a very improbable coincidence, even apart from the fact that we lost the sheet, that we don't have any evidence that we lost that sheet, but... Um, the other piece of evidence that we uh, that is against this is that the ending of Mark, as we have it up to verse eight, exactly reverses the beginning of Mark in in John. And I, I, I analyze this in on the historicity of Jesus. There's a section on it on my book on that where I go into this and show like item by item by item where you have the the voice crying out in the desert or the voice crying out telling people to, that the Messiah is coming, etc. And then you have the women being quiet, right? So you have the reversal. There's, there's shouting out and announcing boldly, and then there's like not telling anybody, right? And this is, there's a lot of reversals. That are, that's not the only one. There's others, uh, and they all line up. So there's actually the, the ending of Mark exactly reverses the beginning of Mark. At the same time, the last chapter of Mark says, basically, as the angels say, go back to Galilee, 
well, the, the book starts, uh, it, not literally in Galilee, but nearly. And, and so the idea is that this idea, this is the other explanation. This is what most scholars think is the case is that the end of the book is telling people to go back to the beginning of, book, of the book and to not do what the Jesus did, but to do, or not what the women did, but to do what John the Baptist did. Right. So, so that it's basically, it, it's kind of a lesson for cycling through the book every year. And then the idea of the epiphanies, the actual visions, those would either be a secret doctrine that would be taught with not written, uh, or it would be not necessarily secret doctrine, but it would be taught orally. Um, the idea is that the, the audience is supposed to interact with what's happening. They didn't get to see Jesus, so they don't get to see Jesus in the book either. They just get the story, and then they get to be brought along on this story, essentially. And so the visions are still referenced, right? It's still, and that's part of the creed, right? So the creed is, an al is also not in Mark, right? We don't have the exact creed spelled out. But the, the book is a guide to the creed. So it's basically, yeah, and then they had the visions, and that's what got the thing started. And if people were telling stories about those visions, and they might not have been, but if they were, it was being told orally. It was not written in the book. So Mark is basically, he's deliberately ending it that way. Now, it would be an extraordinary coincidence if the last verses of Mark exactly reverse the first verses of Mark by accident, right? So like if, if you lose the, the outer sheet, you know, that first page and the last page, and then just by coincidence, what's left exactly matches. Uh, like that's possible, but that requires a very improbable coincidence. So I think this argues against Tabor's theory. It's not a refutation though. Uh, Tabor's theory remains possible. Um, so I'm, I'm not against it. Uh, I think it would be an elegant solution for uh, a lot of things. But at the same time, we have a perfectly normal expl explanation for the ending of Mark. Um, there's, there's actually a study by um, Joel Williams. Uh, it's called Literary Approaches to the Ends of Mark's Gospel. That if you look at that, he goes through all of the attempts to argue that the book wouldn't end this way. In fact, he shows, no, we have lots of evidence that lots of books end like this. Um, so ironic endings, um, down note endings, endings with the uh, particle gar uh, in Greek, right? Like every aspect of it, we have precedence for that in literature. So there's nothing that weird about it. Uh, what you just have to do is interpret what is Mark's point? Like, why, why is he doing it this way as opposed to some other way? And then we have some plausible explanations as to why that is. Okay, so um, my question would be, let's say, you know, Mark was written in 70 AD. That's certainly possible. So would do you think the author of Mark would have heard of the stories, you know, about the, the appearances of Christ to the men as well? and just decided not to write them because it wasn't part of his purpose for writing so, more? We don't know, right? And I think the first thing you should do as a historian is when you don't know something, don't claim something, right? So so we don't know. Uh, we don't know the answer to that. It's maybe, maybe not. Uh, it isn't necessarily the case that the visions were related. Uh, when you look at 2 Corinthians uh, 12, for instance, Paul makes a point that actually when you have these kinds of visions, sometimes you're instructed not to tell people the details of them. Because uh, he says he was given instructions in this vision that he was not to relate. They, they were secret instructions. He was not to tell anybody. Literal utterances, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so in that particular way, it's possible that the content of visions was not a part of the oral lore. It was actually a restricted thing. And they would say, no, only apostles get to know this and talk to each other about it. Um, that's also possible. Uh, it's also possible that there were stories that, uh, and, and they might have been stories that... <laughs> Pre predated the, the John story, right? The one in John 21. Um, and we have a lot of weird stories, like the John 21 stories where they don't even know it's Jesus, right? Like it's just some dude they met and they convince themselves it's Jesus. And you see that also in at the Emmaus narrative uh, and, and in other places where people don't know it's Jesus, but they just convince themselves that it is Jesus. And then that become, that gets embellished over time into, oh, we saw Jesus. Uh, so like, why would that be, um, were there stories like this that, that were more realistic originally, but then be, got exaggerated into these other things? We don't know. There's lots of things that are possible, lots of things that fit the evidence. Uh, and we don't know the answer to that question. Yeah. It's weird. Cause I think in the long ending of Mark, it says Christ appeared onto others in a different form. And to get around it, I think some Christians might say, well, you know, he had a resurrected body and it was supernaturally regenerated. Yeah, well, that's, that's worth noting consideration the first time. So Matthew, what the Matthew specifically says some of them doubted it was him. Right. So he says he appears to them, but some of them weren't sure. Uh, and, and, and that, of course, gets translated into uh, and the word, by the way, for uh, they doubted or they were unsure is of two minds. Uh, I can't remember the exact Greek, but it uses the did a um, uh, prefix. Um, Didymus is the name Thomas, right? It means twin, means two two people. So Thomas, the doubting Thomas story, which kind of like 
fixes some doubted. It's like someone who wrote the Thomas story didn't like Matthew saying that some weren't sure it was him. And so they invented a legend that said, no, 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 no. They double checked. They double, double, triple checked. And they made sure it was him. They touched the wounds, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so John is kind of like trying to refute this, this Mathian uh, legend. Um, but where did the Mathian legend come from? Why is Matthew saying like some of them weren't sure it was him? What does that mean? Uh, it's clearly some sort of meaning that would be explained orally to the readers of the text, to the audience of the text, that was obviously kept from uh, outsiders who would read the text, uh, get a hold of the book and read the text. So it's some other meaning. John didn't like it, so he invented the, the Thomas story and used a riff, a pun. He named the guy based on a pun, or he chose the guy based on a pun uh, of, of two minds, of not certain uh, that it was him, and then made it into Didymus, Thomas Didymus, and then so you go. And Thomas and Didymus are the same name uh, in different languages, and Thomas is listed as, uh, and it means twin in both languages, and it's listed among the apostles all the way back, I think, in Mark. So the character's there uh, for a long time, but no one did anything with it until they saw the, this convenient pun that they could play off of uh, John and Matthew. And that I think that's what's going on with the Thomas story. Um, but again, this this doesn't help us get back to what was preceding all of this. We, we don't know, actually. Okay, gotcha. And then um, before I ask John McDonald's question, just a quick question. Do you believe there was a Q that Mark used Q? I don't know. You don't? Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think it's an extremely implausible theory, actually. Um, it, it was never well argued. Uh, and so I think it, it should have been abandoned. And I think it's led a lot of scholarship to waste, spin its wheels, uh, trying to solve problems that it shouldn't have been. Um, it could have been devoting its resources to what actually happened, which is, I agree with Mark Goodacre on this and several other scholars, we're not alone, um, that uh, what we call Q is just Matthew. Uh, so Luke is just revising and redacting Matthew. Uh, and that's what turned into what we now call the Q material. Okay, interesting. Uh, when I was interviewing Dr. Dennis R. McDonald, Robin Faith Walsh, I showed him a meme, and it was German scholars after inventing Q, and it was a scene from Scarface where Al Pacino's character was counting money and laughing with another <laughs> And he was uh, Dennis R. McDonald's like, that's just dirty, but it's like, that might have some truth to it, you know? It's a good money-making tactic to invent a Q. <laughs> Uh, hey, I, I, I don't agree with that theory, but okay. <laughs> I don't think it, I don't think Q was invented to make money. I, I think there was there were legitimate reasons for trying to come up with it that way. Although some of those reasons were dubious. Um, one of the main drivers of it is that no one wanted to admit that the gospel authors are liars, uh, and so you can't have Luke copying both Mark and Matthew and not telling you why he's changing what he's changing without admitting that Luke is freely redacting a literature. He's not like trying to tell you an honest, well-researched story. Uh, so, so the idea of admitting that Luke used Matthew was, a, was a big apologetical problem in the early 20th century, which created a motive to really push the Q hypothesis to keep Luke and Matthew separate so that you have independent testimony to the, to the source material. But once you admit that Luke is just riffing on Matthew, well, then you don't have independent testimony anymore. You just have authors who are embellishing and elaborating. Um, <clears throat> and yeah, what I've noticed in like the last 10, 20 years is that scholars are starting to get back to admitting that Luke used Matthew. Like there's a lot of scholars who will acknowledge that now. It's like, yeah, okay, that was a dumb idea that we had that Luke didn't use Matthew. We, we admit he did. And there's a lot of really good evidence that he did, right? It's, it's not even like a conjecture. But they're still clinging to Q because of institutional inertia, because Q is so embedded in the field and people found it so useful for whatever pet theories they have that even though now the original reason for Q, the original motive is gone, people are still trying to run with it uh, for various reasons. And Matthew, uh, McDonald is a good example of this. McDonald fully admits that Luke is using Matthew, that Luke knew Matthew and used Matthew, but he still wants to get Q. And he wants to, what he calls Q plus because he has his own version of Q that's different from everybody else's. He wants that because he does have kind of a religious agenda. Like he calls himself a Christian atheist, but he has this religious agenda that he wants to sell people on the original teachings of Jesus about how it was anti-authoritarian uh, and how it was about not being too strict with morality and things like this, that he wants to sell that message as a humanist. Uh, and so he wants that to be true so that he can convince Christians and everybody else that, that this is their guy and they should follow these ideas. Um, so that really he gives him a religious motive to defend his Q plus hypothesis. Um, I don't think the evidence supports the Q plus hypothesis in the long run. Interesting. Thank you very much. All right. So, uh, John, you had a question. I was going to go into your question next, but go on ahead. No, I was just asking whether you wanted me to read my questions. <laughs> 
or um, whether you yeah, can read so them. What what I'll do is I'll read them in the form you gave, and then uh, before Carrier answers, I'll let you uh, talk about the uh, additions you made, the edits you made. I think that'd be better. Okay, sure. Yeah. All righty. So from John McDonald, he asks, one interesting question is the authenticity of the passage claiming that the Jews killed Christ. First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 15, and Matthew chapter 27, verse 25. These are generally seen as later anti-Jewish rival insertions, but they might be highlighting the role God's chosen people played in the divine drama. Another extreme case of the Jews failing God. And another question might be, why did Caesar produce the Matherus inscription? Apparently bodies disappearing from the graves was a problem at the time. So um, I'll just give you those. Um, yeah, did those you want to make any- Two very different questions. So let's focus on that first okay, one. Okay, I'll go to yeah. the first one. Okay, so John, for the first one, uh, was that right? Or did you have anything to add to the first one? Oh, no, that's, that's good. Um, I was just thinking of things like how you know, the Jews were punished by 40 years in the desert for disobeying God, and the Babylonian captivity was because of Jewish sinfulness, and God sent the Assyrians to conquer northern Israel because of their disobedience. So you, you do see that in the in the, the Bible. So what, what are your thoughts on that, Richard? Yeah, uh, I think we need to actually read the text, because the text does not say that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it says something far worse, uh, and it's important what it says and how and the wording that is chosen in the passage. Uh, I will only read 14 to 16 because I personally, so it's, it's debated. First of all, this whole thing is debated in the field. There's scholars who take different positions on all of this, and they differ as to whether verse 13 is original or if it's part of the interpolation. Uh, but all the scholars who agree that it's been interpolated agree that verses 14 to 16 uh, were interpolated. And I actually think that there's a really good case to be made that 13 is authentic and that it, the, the interpolation begins right at the start of um, verse 14. Uh, and again, there's a huge literature on this. Uh, I cite some of it in my book on the historicity of Jesus. I have a few pages where I talk about this passage and I give a, a probabilistic argument as to why it's probably uh, uh, not authentic. That's probably an insertion. Uh, I can't go into all the evidence. In fact, I, I am actually working on an article now <clears throat> that goes into all the literature, especially some of the most recent stuff and all the evidence, much more comprehensive treatment uh, and, and why we think the scholars like us, like me who think that it's interpolation, why we're pretty convinced that it is. Um, <clears throat> but here's what it says, verses 14 to 16 in 1 Thessalonians 2. Uh, For you, brothers and sisters, became imitators of God's churches in Judea, which are in Christ Jesus. You suffered from your own people the same things those churches suffered from the Jews, who killed the Lord Jesus and the prophets and also drove us out. They displease God and are hostile to everyone. The word is actually, they hate everyone uh, in their effort to keep us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. In this way, they always heap up their sins to the limit. The wrath of God has come upon them at last. And that's the NIV translation. You can look at other translations. So uh, the first thing we notice about this is that whoever wrote these verses was not a Jew. Paul is a Jew. Uh, Paul never talks about himself as if he wasn't one of the people that he's talking about uh, in this passage. So he's not going to say that, oh, I hate all people and I'm preventing everybody from doing everything, etc. Paul is a Jew. The idea of a distinction between Jews and Christians is post-Pauline. Uh, so whoever wrote this passage is someone writing in the second century who now has basically classified the Jews as the enemies of all mankind, like they hate everybody, uh, and as the opponents of his church, so they're the enemies of the church. Whereas this is someone who's writing in a place where the Jews and Christians have, divor have divorced, they're separated, uh, they're basically in competition with each other, even war at war, you know, cultural war with each other. When Paul wrote, his churches are mixed. His churches already have Jews in them. They, they're a mixture of Jews and uh, Gentiles. And Paul himself, of course, is Jewish. And the, the churches he talks about in Judea were primarily Jewish churches. They're not Gentile churches. And so uh, there's a lot of confusion in whoever's writing these, these verses is clearly not Paul because they don't see the world from the perspective that Paul does. And they have weird ideas about how things, history progressed. For instance, he's complaining about the Jews preventing them from preaching to Gentiles in Judea, but that what, wasn't a thing. There, wasn't a, there weren't like Gentiles that they were like, principally preaching to in, in there. Uh, there was a small, very small Gentile uh, mission in Judea, but the predominance of the Judean mission was Jewish, like they were converting Jews. The original Christians are Jews, the apostles are Jews, Paul's a Jew. 
Uh, so, so for him to speak of the Jews like he wasn't one of them is just flat out impossible. Uh, he certainly himself talks about how the Jews can be punished, uh, at including himself in that number for the sins. But he also speaks repeatedly in his letters about how the Jews will be redeemed. Uh, and that, that there will be actually a select, you know, the elect of the Jews will actually get saved and they will even be given priority over the Gentiles. So that's, there's a lot of that. Uh, there's many particular, we can't go into every detail, but there's many particular ways that this passage is co completely against what Paul would have said. Um, <clears throat> even if he wanted to paint it in the way that you were describing, uh, if he wanted to say that, he would have said it differently than this. Whoever wrote these verses is not Jewish. And, and in fact, they're not only not Jewish, they don't have Jews in their church. Uh, they're, they're, they see the Jews as nothing but the enemies of Christians. So they see Christians and Jews as separate peoples. Another issue is he says the wrath of God has come upon them at last. Uh, there have been a lot of apologetic attempts to try and get that to be something other than the Jewish war, um, but none of them make any grammatical or theological or contextual sense. So it's very clear that whoever wrote this it was writing it after the, the destruction of Judea and the Jewish temple. And he's saying, yeah, the wrath of God has come upon them at last. It's done. Uh, he's, he's, he's judged them. It's already in, in the past. So, but Paul died before the Jewish war. So uh, Paul can't have written that, right? So we know he didn't write that after the Jewish war. So this someone is after the Jewish war is writing it. Uh, now, like I said, th these things are debated. You can look at scholars advancing different apologetic arguments to try and get around the things that I've just said. There are other scholars who are defending the things I've just said. So it is a complex debated issue. Uh, but I think when you actually get to looking at all the evidence and all the arguments and evaluating which ones are strong and which ones are weak, you end up with this conclusion that verses 14 to 16 weren't written uh, by Paul. I'm also uh, working on an article uh, in fact, it's it's in review now. I've submitted it on um, how there's a chiastic structure uh, to the second chapter where verses 17 on don't seem to be aware of verses 14 to 16. Uh, and, and that requires a complicated literary argument. But you can show through the rhetorical progression of Paul's argument uh, that he doesn't even know about the things that are said in there. Like there's no reference to a persecution in Thessalonia anywhere else in the letter, not in letter one. Uh, even scholars will claim it, but it's not there. Uh, it's, the only tribulation he references in Thessalonia was before Paul arrived and converted them. So it was a it was a tribulation that his converting of them uh, cured and, and solved. Uh, it is not a tribulation that occurred after the conversion, right? So there's no reference to the persecution. There's no reference to it in chapter three. Uh, there's there's a reference that one can read as a reference to it, but actually when you look at the Greek and you look in context, it isn't describing that. So Paul actually doesn't know about uh, a persecution of the Thessalonians, but you know where one does appear? In 2 Thessalonians. 2 Thessalonians doesn't know about the interpolation in 1 Thessalonians too. So the, the forger of 2 Thessalonians, which is a forgery, they don't, th their version of 1 Thessalonians doesn't have this interpolation in it. <clears throat> but they go on and they invent this idea of a persecution in Thessalonica, uh, but don't mention uh, the, the Jewish question connect, connected to it. Uh, so whoever wrote the interpolation, the verses 14 to 16 in 1 Thessalonians, is someone who read 2 Thessalonians, which is a forgery that was written after 1 Thessalonians. Uh, and, <clears throat> and anyway, so like, like you, you can stack up evidence like this. It starts to look pretty bad for anyone who wants to claim authenticity. But again, like I said, this is all debated. There's no way I can resolve and convince you of it uh, here in, in you know just a few minutes on here. But you got to actually read the literature on this. My articles that are coming out will be super helpful because they really organize it all. You have a blog post too, don't you, on this issue? I do, but the blog post just summarizes uh, what I put in on the historicity of Jesus. So, uh, mm -hmm. so yeah, if people want to go to a quick summary of what I wrote in on the historicity of Jesus, then yes, my blog on uh, First Thessalonians and why we think uh, it's not believable. But uh, I've mentioned arguments here that aren't in there uh, because okay. when I did the, the when I'm doing the new article now, which uh, I actually just submitted that for peer review as well. <clears throat> when I did that article, I did a thorough, thorough, thorough search of all the literature on this and did all the arguments. And so the the, the arguments stack even more devastatingly than I than I list in uh, the the blog article. So the blog article. Is helpful for people who want to be situated, but there's actually more evidence even uh, that I discuss there. Okay, very good. And um, so my second or third question, as Ed had said, had to do with the Nazareth inscription and just the idea that maybe bodies were disappearing from graves was a problem at the time when the graves were getting robbed and stuff. Um, what I was thinking, the reason I asked you about this is um, you, you and James Tabor, I think, both talk about the new resurrection body, how 
-hmm. the old body isn't right doesn't just disappear but it's left behind um so what i was wondering is because robin faith walsh talks about apotheosis imagery with yeah. um tombs missing the bodies and then the idea is that the the person had been taken by the gods to become a god so like in Carton's novel so what's what are yeah. your thoughts on that so that that last point is true and i would tell people uh the um there's a new book by richard miller um well newish anyway uh resurrection and reception in early christianity by by richard miller fantastic book and it, it does exactly it talks about that so it shows that this is actually a trope in mythology uh in the right in literature particularly uh literary forms of mythology use the empty tomb motif and and other motifs there's a lot of motifs that get in this this trope this cluster of ideas <clears throat> they use that uh to sell the idea of apotheosis they're making fun of it yeah right so like uh which tells us that there was a thing to make fun of so there was actually a literary trope uh, that you can find that way. And there's a lot of evidence for it. Um, the trope, however, like I said, is literary. So it, it can explain the gospels and why they're the way they, why they fall back into these literary tropes. Um, but it doesn't explain Paul uh, in, the, in the earliest literature that we have, because they're not dealing with literary tropes. They're dealing with a theological belief that's come to them through scriptures and, and visions, right? So uh, they're not necessarily even thinking about empty tombs. Uh, they might be, but they're not thinking, but not necessarily thinking about it. We don't have evidence of that in there. The question of whether um, the body of Jesus, whether Paul thought uh, that the body that rises is not the one uh, that dies, that, that he leaves the, the body behind as a shell, the, the, because flesh and blood can't inherit the kingdom, so it just left behind, you jump into a new body. Uh, this was Origen, the, the church scholar Origen's view as well, uh, and so on. That's a whole other debate, uh, and I have written on that. Um, I have a debate on it at the secular web. You can find it on my website through, if you go to my website and on the top link, some of the, the menu is writings, go into writings, go into Jesus stuff. And in the Jesus stuff, somewhere in there is my debate. Uh, I can't remember the name of the person I debated, but I did a whole debate on this that referenced my literature. The, the main treatise on this is the chapter on the body, the resurrection body in um, uh, The Empty Tomb, which was edited by Jeff Lauder and Robert Price. That's where all this stuff comes from. That's yeah. a whole separate debate, right? Um, that's different from the Nazareth inscription, which is a whole other debate. Uh, and I do, I have a whole chapter on this in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ, that book I just showed. So that has two issues we've talked about today, the ending of Mark and uh, the Nazareth inscription. Uh, there's a number of, of things wrong with how the Nazareth inscription has been reported. Mostly it's been reported by Christian apologists and people who just believe them. Uh, and that's always a problem. You should never believe Christian apologists. You should always check uh this the here's the things there's several things wrong with it um first uh it was not an inscription produced by the roman state it was produced by a private citizen probably someone who managed a graveyard uh it does contain a decree from the state from the emperor um <clears throat> and, but anyway it has misspellings and things like that it's, it's actually a cheap knockoff inscription that someone put up somewhere um, secondly, it wasn't from Nazareth. Uh, Nazareth is just where the black market was in ancient antiquities in the early 20th century. So it was looted from somewhere and then brought to Nazareth and sold. So when people say Nazareth inscription, it's actually not an inscription from Nazareth. We actually don't know where it's from, but because it references uh, paying cult to family, it's, it refers to ancestor cult, uh, it almost certainly did not come from Jewish territory. It's probably from somewhere, a pagan territory. Uh, possibly in uh, Syria near there, because uh, near near the Holy Land <clears throat> or Palestine, uh, whichever you want to call it, uh, near that is the Decapolis, because Jesus is even portrayed as going there to the Decapolis. And the Decapolis were these 10 free cities that had a treaty relationship with the Roman Empire. They're pagan. Uh, and that's why there's a, the, the Gerasene swine. That's why they have pigs over there and so on. It's, it's, it's a Gentile territory. That's a more likely... Uh, place that this inscription came from because it clearly is a decree it was written for managing pagan graveyards it, it doesn't refer to jewish graveyards or jewish grave law at all another thing is that it just uh applies that law that already existed this is a law that's existed for hundreds of years uh and and continues to get modified and reissued for hundreds of years more uh there's actually nothing new about it uh there's nothing peculiar or strange about it uh, it also it focuses on uh, actual material thievery, so stealing door tombs, stealing stones, 
uh, moving graves and things like that. It does talk about uh, defiling bodies, um, but it's just a list of th of crimes that constitute desecration of graves. Uh, so it's clearly it's a broader law that doesn't ha doesn't relate to any particular event. It's just a general. It's an accumulated legislation over time about all the things that people get annoyed with and the mistreatment of graveyards, and then they just make it illegal to do that. Another thing is that it does not name the Caesar who wrote, who issued the decree, which strongly suggests it was Caesar. In other words, Julius Caesar, the original Caesar. Uh, so it wasn't even Augustus. It wasn't even Tiberius. Uh, most likely it was Julius Caesar, which would put this uh, before 44 B.C., Right. Yeah. So uh, so long before Christianity. Uh, and so um, that's just a few things. There, there are other issues with it. Uh, but that once you go through that list of things, I go through all of that. If people are interested in going into this and the translation and the Greek and all of that uh, is in Hitler, Homer, Bible, Christ. I've got a whole chapter on it. Excellent. And uh, my last question, um, I, I had mentioned to you when I interacted with you on your website that um Ehrman has had suggested that with um, stories like the rich young man and the sheep and the goats, um, with the rich young man, you have an idea of salvation comes through um, salvation comes through following the, the commandments and giving to the poor. And Ehrman thinks that this is original and goes back before Jesus died because um, because there's no crucifixion or resurrection theology in it so it goes against marx mark would have would have been marx's desire to to put that in there um it's yeah my own take my own my okay, own take yeah. on it is we have um stories that keep the keep hidden the crucifixion and resurrection as a key for salvation like with the rich young man story um but maybe that's related to the the whole messianic secret issue or would you like to talk about that well as i recall i'm gonna make sure um i'll make sure i'm not getting this wrong here it is uh, let me make sure i get that right um <clears throat> where is where is that can you give me the verses on that the rich young man Oh goodness! Um, one second. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone on the fly. Uh, okay, the rich in the kingdom of God. Okay. Mark do you ten do you have it? seventeen. Mark ten chapter seventeen. I'm sorry, Mark chapter ten verse seventeen to thirty-one. Yeah, I got it. Uh, yeah, ten chapter ten. Uh, right, exactly as you said. Um. <clears throat> So let's see, let me make sure. Yeah, okay, so it's in the context, right? You have to understand in the context. So immediately after that, he does the whole uh, death and resurrection thing. And <clears throat> where he's talking about, I have to, and so he basically says, you know, it's it's difficult for people to get into heaven, but many who are first will be last and the last first, et cetera. Um, but then he immediately goes into the gospel, right? So he's the story is always relating it to the gospel. So there, it isn't the case that the story is written as if Jesus' sacrifice is not relevant. Uh, it is written uh, with the idea, is, you're going to remember when Mark is writing, there's two churches. Uh, there's the Pauline church and there's the Jewish church. They're still largely merged. So they're not like separate churches yet, but they're two groups within the same churches who are at odds with each other about what is required for salvation. And Paul himself talks about this in Galatians 2, where he has the, the Judaizers who are the actual, the original apostles to say, no, you still have to be Torah observant. You don't just get a free pass. You have to, you know, you have to be kosher. You have to have a circumcision, etc. Uh, and Paul is the one who innovated the idea that, well, actually Gentiles don't have to do that. Mm -hmm. And then he did sell that idea and basically got them to buy into it uh, eventually. And there's a whole other you can go into why or how that happened. I have suspicions and, and there's evidence regarding it. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so when Mark's writing, he's writing basically for both audiences. So there are already members of his church uh, who think that you still have to follow Torah, but also Jesus is the Yom Kippur. And Yom Kippur is is totally Jewish, right? There's, that still existed even in, before Jesus, is the idea that there would be a universal atonement for all the sins of Israel, but it has to be repeated every year. And this is explained in Hebrews 9. So if you read Hebrews 9, it's like the way the system worked is you would get your sins forgiven, 
uh, every year by this, this temple sacrifice. Well, when P Mark is writing, the temple doesn't exist anymore. And of course, his whole mission is to sell Jesus as the replacement of the temple. So when he has Jesus talking to this guy about, oh, yeah, you got to follow the commandments. Uh, that's true. Like even Gentile Christians were expected to still follow the commandments. But the question is, is how do you get them? How do you get your sins forgiven? And Jesus is talking, well, here's the, the, the way to do it completely. You know, is you have to give away all your money to the to the poor and, and so on. <clears throat> but then he immediately breaks into the whole about like, I have to die, et cetera. Well, why does he have to die? Well, because he's going to be the Yom Kippur that, that every year, instead of every year, now it's going to be a permanent one. But the question of how you gain that 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 uh, that salvation is not explicitly stated anywhere in Mark. Uh, even though he's writing, he's using Paul's epistles even as source material he has that as that's part of the oral pre preaching that would go with the book, but the book is giving you all that other stuff. So, so the question is, do I think it connects with the messianic secret? I would answer yes. Once you understand the messianic secret as Paul himself talking about how there are secrets that are only certain people of certain ranks uh, can get to. And that only, and, and that the idea in um, first Corinthians two, where the, uh, the, the evil powers, the demonic forces were kept in the dark, like it was a secret kept from them. Now, the Gospel of Mark fails to depict that, right? Because it has the demons automatically knowing everything, which completely contradicts the creed, makes no sense of the, of the theology of Paul. <clears throat> but he's preserving the concept that it still had to be kept secret until it was fulfilled. And it's a literary device, so it, it isn't historical. Like, it makes no sense as history, uh, which is how we know, one of many reasons we know it's not history. It makes no sense as history, but it makes sense as a story, as, as like a mythological fable of yeah, the messianic secret that's important, and then we can we can teach you about it like out, off book basically. Uh, and so that's I think that's the kind of thing that's going on in Mark. He's using literary tales to convey ideas. He's not trying to be historically realistic, uh, and the way he he communicates is through the juxtaposition of passages and material. So it matters what Jesus talks about after he talks about the rich man. The order of things is important to Mark. Do you think the messianic secret in Mark might relate to the arrest? Because it's kind of an odd detail for Mark to have the disciples getting violent at the arrest. And um, if they, if any of them had any clue that the Jesus was supposed to die. So maybe it was well known that Jesus's disciples clashed with the arresting party. And then Mark just had to retroactively go back and say, well, he kept the, the crucifixion a secret from the people and he told the disciples, but they didn't understand it. And what do you think about that line of line of reasoning? Well, anything's possible, right? You know, so, but the question is, what do we have evidence for that? Uh, and the way Mark writes this, the rest, the arrest scene, like none of it is historically plausible. So he's clearly making choices. He's choosing what to put in there. So like, like if there was a battle, he would just delete it, right? Like he wouldn't have one dude use one sword and cause one wound to one person and then have everyone present completely ignore that he did that, right? <laughs> like the, 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 all those armed guards there just don't do anything, right? They don't, they don't, they don't arrest that guy. They don't kill him. There's not a fight. Uh, so the story makes zero sense as history. And, and that means it can't be historical. There's there's no history there. There has to be something symbolic about it. Uh, and I, I've seen some suggestions, for instance, that it matters that it's the, the uh, slave of the high priest who's maimed. Uh, those who are maimed can no longer approach the altar, uh, <clears throat> for example. And a lot of the language in Matthew's version of this, not in Mark's, but in Matthew's version of this, Matthew has rewritten the uh, the, the sword attack scene uh, to match the language of Abraham and Isaac and and the, the would-be sacrifice. So, uh, I, and I think Matthew does that a lot to Mark. So where I think Matthew gets what Mark is getting at mm -hmm. and then tries to make it better, like, and tries to improve it. And so I suspect Mark also had something like that in mind, but I haven't really looked into the literature to see uh, which things the evidence holds up the best. But I think odds are the story comes from some sort of mythical allegorical purpose, that there's some message there, possibly again, something that would be explained off book, just like Mark says in Mark, uh, Mark 4, says to Jesus, you know, to outsiders, we we tell parables so that they'll be confused. Only the insiders will be told what those parables really mean. Uh, and as John Dominic Crossan writes in The Power of Parable, the whole gospel is that. It is an entire parable that is written for outsiders to not understand what that's really about. But insiders will be told. Uh, and so the idea is when Mark is writing, I think he understands that insiders, churchgoers, will be told what these stories mean. Uh, and there's a lot of examples of, of very clear evidence of this kind of construction in Mark, where his completely implausible stories like the, the Gerasene swine is a classic example. There's no way that's history. Or the withering of the fig tree. 
not history. Uh, so what the hell is he doing? Like, what do those things mean? Uh, and there's been a lot of good scholarship analyzing, oh, there's actually good allegorical literary meanings for these, but they're behind the text. They're not in the text. They're not explicit. It's not explicit. Uh, and so Mark writes that way. He does that a lot. Uh, and so we should expect he's doing that here just as he does everywhere else. Uh, and so that's that would be my answer to that question. Thank you very much. Awesome. All righty. Well, we got a bunch of questions for you, but, you know, we made an agreement on time. And, and we'll respect yeah. that. This, we could just have like a three hour conversation. Right. Yeah, yeah. So many no, things. I, yeah. I've got one I've got question things to get back to another to. one. Yeah. yeah gotcha. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, you did a very good job and we asked a good amount of questions with the time we had. So once again, thank you, Dr. Richard Carrier, the king of all Christ myth theorists for being yeah, on. Yeah. I appreciate you coming on this. I think this is our fifth interview we've done. And thanks, uh, John McDonald, for coming on again. Uh, Carrier's written about me and John on his blog, so you, you should check out his official blog. He talks about us, talks about yeah, that's, John's uh, paper. Yeah, richardcarrier.info, richardcarrier.info. Uh, you can find everything about me there, the, the online courses I teach, if you want to take those things, all my books, uh, my Twitter and Facebook feeds are linked through there. Uh, my blog, obviously, is there, uh, and then lots of other things. So anything you want to know about me, or get connect uh, with my work or any of that, you'll find it at uh, richardcarrier.info. All righty. Thank you very much, and you'll have a good day. All right. All right. Yeah, you, you too, guys. Uh, have a good Saturday.